thank you all of you for joining us wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you on behalf of the Energy Law Institute and our co-hosts, the Alan Turing Institute, to this, I think, the fourth session of the Scotia Group's programme of de debates on climate change in anticipation of COP26 in Glasgow later in the year. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Scotia Group and Professor Malik Darlan in particular for their tireless efforts to establish this programme. Whilst I've called it a programme of debates, it is also worth reminding ourselves that the very firm objective of the group is to identify concrete measures which can make a difference to the challenge that climate change presents. Their aim is uh, action, not discourse. Just briefly, it was 1992 when the world gathered in Rio to discuss the impact anthropogenic emissions were having on the world's climate. It led to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in that, the parties acknowledged the change in the Earth's climate and its effects are a common concern of mankind. And they proclaimed the ultimate objective of the convention is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So the world was ready to act. So what has happened? Since then, the parties to the convention have met 25 times. They have yet to agree, however, a voting procedure. The population of the world has increased by 2.4 billion people, the same uh, as when I was born back in 1955. And most importantly of all, the cumulative emissions of CO2 for which mankind is responsible, which in the 240 years since the start of the Industrial Revolution had reached 860 million tonnes by 1992, has now doubled in less than 30 years. We're shuffling towards the abyss, and as we do it, we're gently nudging the flora and fora we share this earth with over the edge. In short, we've done far, far too little, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that. That said, in the brief life, seven year life of the Energy Law Institute, I've witnessed a tectonic shift in emphasis. Climate change is impacting every aspect of what we teach in the sector, from the nature of the projects being undertaken to the attitudes of regulators, lenders, investors, and governments. The courts of the world are awash with challenges to governance, inaction, and corporate failings. And international oil companies are facing the need for rapid change or a future as seemingly improbable 50 years ago as the fate of the once most populous bird in the world, the passenger pigeon the last example of which, Martha, died in Cincinnati Zoo on the 1st of September 1914. And there used to be, it is estimated, between three and five billion of them. So things can take a strange turn. With that, I will pass over to the eminently capable hands of Howard Covington, uh, the founding chair of the Alan Turing Institute, and also the chair of environmental law organization, Plant Earth. Howard, over to you. James, uh, thank you very much uh, for that and welcome everyone. Um, that's uh, something of a blood curdling introduction to follow. I will do my best. Uh, <laughs> the recent extreme weather events in the American West, in Central Europe, and this week in the North China Plain have been tragic and dreadful, but they show us graphically that even the world's most powerful regions are not going to escape the brutal effects of climate change. As this realization dawns, we seem to have reached a point of inflection. The climate problem is now widely recognized as deeply serious. Clean tech is competitive with fossil tech and rapidly getting cheaper. 
and governments have promised huge and fast emissions reductions. The challenge now is how to ensure the implementation of these reductions. One of the most important tools for forcing the pace of implementation is the law. And I mean both the laws that governments adopt and the decisions forced on them by their courts. Now, the Alan Turing Institute and Queen Mary both have deep interests in this. The Alan Turing Institute is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Queen Mary is one of the Turing's 13 university partners. Together, we're applying AI and big data to controlling the UK's energy grid so it, it can better cope with intermittent renewables, to simulating the consequences of energy policy to get a better handle on the uncertainties, to monitoring emissions in the UK and around the world, and to creating a climate dashboard to better warn of impending weather extremes and the devastation they are going to bring. Separately, Queen Mary is prominent in the study and development of energy and climate change law, as you've heard. Now, the UK is a great case study for all of this. It adopted its path-breaking Climate Change Act in 2008. It's powering ahead with offshore wind. A few years ago, its courts forced it to abandon diesel vehicles and switch to electric. And it's made aggressive uh, emissions reductions commitments and like all other major countries, it's falling behind its promises. I suggest what we do in this discussion is take the fast clean tech progress as given and ask how laws, courts and institutions can be used to keep governments to their climate promises. We have three superbly distinguished speakers to guide us. Firstly, Lord Adair Turner, who was not only Director General of the Confederation of British Industry and Chairman of the UK's Financial Services Authority, but fundamentally for our discussions was the inaugural chair of the UK's Climate Change Committee that plays a central role in the operation of the UK's Climate Change Act. Secondly, we have Sir William Blair, who's been a Queen's Counsel and High Court Judge and is now Professor of Financial Law and Ethics at Queen Mary. Bill has a particular interest in how environmental provisions can be used in contract law. And thirdly, Lord David Howell, who was Secretary of State for Energy and Transport under Margaret Thatcher, and more recently has been Ministry of, Minister of State in the Foreign Office and Chair of the House of Lords International Relations Committee. Lord Howell <clears throat> has some quite strong views on the lack of progress in reducing emissions. Since China is fundamental to our understanding, I've also asked my client Earth colleague, Dimitri de Boer, to speak briefly to us on China from Beijing. Dimitri knows as much as anyone in the world about China's environmental policies and how they are evolving. So with those introductions made, let's begin. Adair, please tell us about the UK's Climate Change Act in practice. Howard, thank you very much. As Howard has said, I was the first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee uh, from 2008 to 12. I now chair a global uh, commission, a voluntary coalition uh, called the Energy Transitions Commission, which works in China, in India, uh, in Australia, uh, in Europe, uh, and in uh, the US. Uh, and we are convinced that in order to deal with the climate challenges, which people have already talked about, we need to get the whole world to net zero emissions by around mid-century, all the developed countries there by 2050 at the latest, all developing by 2060 at the latest. And from our analysis, we're absolutely clear that that is technologically doable with a combination of first direct electrification, second most important hydrogen, and then a minor but still important role for bioresources and CCS. We're also confident that once we get there, we can get to uh, these zero carbon economies at costs to global living standards, which will be minute, well less than 1%. So to that extent, that is just reinforcing Howard's point, the clean tech is there, it's available. But the crucial thing is that clean tech only becomes available and comes down in cost if you have forceful policies. Last month in Saudi, there was a auction for solar, which was won at $10 per megawatt hour, one cent per kilowatt hour. 
In Germany in 2000, farmers were being subsidized to put solar panels on their roofs and were being paid 40 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that is a reduction of 97.5% in 20 years. But we would only have got to where we are today if we had had forceful policies to subsidize the initial stages of technology in order to drive the economy of scale and learning curve effects which drive these costs down. Those policies in some sectors, such as road transport, electric automobiles, will actually eventually deliver decarbonization at zero cost. Consumers are going to be better off within 10 years when they buy and run electric vehicles rather than internal combustion engines. But there are some other sectors, hard to abate sectors, what we call them, such as shipping and aviation, plastics and cement, where there will always be some cost premium to achieving a zero carbon economy. The zero carbon solution will always be somewhat more expensive than the high carbon solution. In terms of the impact on consumer living standards, that will be trivial because not many of us buy either directly or indirectly all that much steel. If the price of steel goes up 25%, the price of the electric auto you buy goes up by well less than 1%. But at the business to business level, if you don't have policy to bridge the gap between the high carbon route and the low carbon route, the good guys who are trying to build the low carbon route will be out of business. If one steel company moves to hydrogen based direct reduction rather than coking coal and adds 25% to its cost of production, it will be uncompetitive unless you have carbon prices. So clearly we need strong policies. Those policies take many forms. They take the forms of regulation, of carbon pricing, of sometimes direct subsidies. But it is very important for business that those policies are either known specifically in advance or that business knows that in some form or other, they will be applied in advance. It is very, very important to a steel company, a shipping company, that they know that the government is committed irrevocably to a reduction in emissions, which will inevitably result in policies which will make it economic to go down the low carbon route. And that is why targets are very important. Targets are very important even if they are simply covering where we want to be in 2050 or 2060. Once you have clear national commitments, corporates immediately act. Last September, China committed to get to zero emissions by 2060, and almost immediately, Baowu Steel, the biggest Chinese steel company, committed to be a zero carbon steel producer by 2050. Once governments set the context, corporates act. But the specific feature of the UK Climate Change Act is that it not only establishes a clear target for 2050, it establishes a clear sense of the pathway from here to there. And therefore it helps get over the problem of time inconsistency, which governments can have of wanting to be committed in a sort of Augustinian sense to being moral by 2050, but not taking action today. So the structure of the Climate Change Act, which received Royal Assent in 2008, is that it sets the end date target. Initially, when it passed through Parliament, it was actually a 60% reduction by 2050. Almost immediately in our first year as the Climate Change Committee, we recommended and government accepted and Parliament enacted an increase to an 80% reduction. And it's now, after a 29 amendment, a 100% reduction. That's the end 2050 target. But what the Act also set in place was these five-year budgets. It defines how much CO2 the UK will emit from 2008 to 12. That was the first carbon budget period, 2013 to 17, the second budget period. And what Parliament ends up agreeing is three of those in advance, so that we can see not only the 2050 target, but what the profile has to be for the next 15 years. And the way it works is that the Climate Change Committee 
is always looking at and then recommending what should be the next along the line of the budgets. It has just recommended and the government has accepted the, carbon, the climate budget for 2033 to 37, which is the sixth carbon budget, but it will soon start working on the seventh carbon budget from 38 to 42. So these budgets are set out. And once they are set out, subject to a little bit of borrowing and lending from budget to budget, it is illegal for governments to exceed them. Now, there are many more people expert in the law here than I am, who will be able to talk about what does it mean when a government breaks a law? It doesn't, and perhaps it's a little unfortunate in this respect, it doesn't actually mean that we take off the Prime Minister to the Tower of London uh, to be dealt with in an appropriate fashion, but it does mean that it is illegal. It does mean that you can use courts to bring judicial reviews, to have the courts tell government you are breaking the law, you have got to take action to come back within the law. But even if you don't use those legal mechanisms, the very fact that Parliament has set up these clear targets, has enacted these clear targets, makes it difficult for government to move away from them, or indeed it's useful for government because it means that government has a forcing device mechanism at work throughout government saying, we better take action because otherwise we're going to breach the carbon budget. That commitment mechanism is reinforced by the role of the Climate Change Committee and its secretariat. The Act sets up a Climate Change Committee, and I think it is important to realise that the Climate Change Committee is appointed by Parliament, not by government, and formally reports to Parliament, not to government. Government has to see whether it accepts the recommendations of the Climate Change Committee and whether it intends to enact them, but it cannot kill our reports as uh, some other commissions appointed by government can. We are a creature of Parliament, uh, not government. The Act has therefore created quite a powerful and export group, expert group. It's not a huge body. The Secretariat is about 25 or 30 people, but they are very high quality. And it produces, I believe, uh, when I was there and certainly subsequently, high quality analysis of what it is we need to do to set the appropriate carbon budgets uh, and to meet them. It involves detailed analysis of what is possible. How fast can you decarbonize road transport? Down to nitty gritty details, which are what are called stock flow models. Once you have a certain percentage of new sales of automobiles being electric, how many years does that take before it changes the stock? Once you start making sure that every new steel mill is zero carbon compatible, how long does that take to have an impact. So the Climate Change Committee is continually looking at the feasible economic path from A to B, but within a non-negotiable commitment that we will get to net zero by 2050, and increasingly that we have to do it in a pace which is compatible with the Paris Climate Agreement and with our commitments under what are called national determined contributions. So we began with the first budget of 2008 to 12. It is true to say that we greatly overperformed that budget in the sense of emissions were well below it. Why was that? Was that because of great action by our government? Well, it was not. It was because of the global financial crisis and an enormous economic recession. Uh, if you want to uh, immediately do better than your targets, engineer a large recession. But one of the things we did then, and we developed a very clear mechanism of adjusting where we were to saying, where would we have been on the normal economic path? And we also created a mechanism to say, where would we have been if the weather that year had been normal? Because year by year, the amount of your emissions varies with how cold the winter is. It varies with the sense of a, uh, the, the, the economic situation of the country. So the committee has a very careful sense of having, as it were, a annual adjustment mechanism to see where we are in a long-term pattern. Broadly speaking, so far we have met the three 
budgets where we are at the moment. But unless we tighten policy very significantly, we will not meet future budgets. In 2019, Theresa May, as one of her last acts of government, decided that she wanted to accept the advice that the budget, the, the target should be a 100% reduction by 2050. And Parliament put that through in the middle of 2019. The Climate Change Committee then at the end of the last year proposed the sixth carbon budget, as I've said, and that requires by 2035, a reduction in 78% of emissions below the 1990 level. Those are stretching targets and they will require action uh, by government. And they will require more action by government than it has taken so far. I would say that in some areas, that target is already changing policies. And there are a couple of sectors where I am quite confident that we are on a path, the path that we need to be. I think the UK is heading towards having a deeply decarbonized electricity system by 2035. That the Climate Change Committee has said will require 40 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, in the North Sea by 2030. And last September, uh, the Prime Minister stood up and committed the government to 40 gigawatts. So that's a translation of a general overall commitment into a specific policy. Equally, in the area of road transport, the government is now committed to completely banning the sale of pure internal combustion engines by 2030 uh, in passenger cars. And that would not have happened without the forcing device of this expert body created by parliament. There are some other areas, however, where we are not making as much progress. One of the most difficult areas to decarbonize is residential heat, to move people away from the use of gas boilers to either hydrogen or electric heat pumps or electric resistive heating. This actually, unlike road transport, which will where decarbonization will make consumers better off, this is where there are net costs for consumers. And so this is where there really will need to be a vision by government as to whether it is itself going to expend money or whether it's going to regulate and force individuals to spend money. And so far, there is not a clear plan. So sometimes we have the aim, even 15 years out, but we don't yet have the clear plan. But the fact that we have the Climate Change Committee creates somebody, as it were, on the shoulder of government, continually saying to them, where is this plan? Where is this plan? You have got to produce it. So that gives you an idea of what the structure of the Climate Change Committee is and what I think has been the key to its success. And I think it has been a success. It still has a lot of work to do, but without it, without the act and without that structure, I don't think we would be in a position of saying that we can really by 2035 have a credible probability of having a 78% emissions reduction below 1990 levels on a credible path to zero by 2050. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. That was absolutely fabulous. The, the thought that the expression, your expression that stays in my mind is the Climate Change Committee as a forcing device, a forcing device to travel down the right emissions trajectory. Now, Bill, um, I'm just going to ask you, uh, the, the courts and the use of law is another forcing device. So tell us, tell us about that from your perspective. Well, firstly, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, uh, to uh, the Scotia group, Malik Dallin and uh, James Dallas particularly, and to you, Howard, uh, for uh, chairing. You have done, uh, if I may say so, more than your fair share in uh, pushing uh, for uh, the kind of action that needs to be taken. Uh, let, let me just begin, if, I'm, if I may, with the usual caveat. Uh, as a, a sitting judge in various jurisdictions and an arbitrator, of course, I'm not speaking about any continuing case, and uh, I'm speaking in my, in my academic role as a professor at Queen Mary. One other point that I'd like to make at the, the beginning is this, that um, I come from this as a commercial and financial lawyer, 
And uh, a point I'd like to make in uh, the course of my brief remarks is that we, we may be seeing something of a fourth wave of litigation emerging. Uh, so far, um, the great bulk of um, climate change litigation has been in the public law field, uh, very often against governments. And by the way, let me pick up the point that both uh, you made, Howard, and Lord Turner made as well. Uh, it's very, very rare in my experience anyway, that a defendant actually likes losing a case. Um, but it, it does uh, give um, appropriate leverage in, in government, I think. Uh, and uh, um, it, uh, that's uh, something to, uh, to uh, um, bear in mind. But uh, let me um, uh, perhaps though uh, begin with uh, a few statistics because uh, I think you're looking to me for a slightly more granular view of how the courts actually uh, are um, internationally uh, uh, dealing with these issues. A point that I've made before and repeat is this that uh, we're talking mainly of uh, uh, domestic courts and regional courts. There is an ICC in The Hague, but it's an international criminal court. It's not an international climate change court. So you end up, uh, and this is not a, a, a criticism but it, at all, it's simply a, a reflection of, of uh, uh, what is the inevitable result of where we are, you do end up with something of a patchwork. There are differences, for example, in the way that uh, civil law countries approach these questions and common law countries. Uh, for for non-lawyers, uh, um, England is, the, is, is a common law country, the, the, the home of the common law, but the US system of common law is rather different. There are plenty of other common law systems around the world like India. But let me, uh, let me give you <clears throat> some of these statistics and I'm going to take a, a, a useful document published a couple of weeks ago by the LOC and is looking at a, a position globally up to the 31st of May. Uh, the databases they looked at contain 1,848 ongoing or concluded cases of climate change litigation around the world of which 75% came from the United States. In the year 20, uh, to, uh, 2020 to 2021 uh, so far, 191 new cases have been filed. And I'd, I'd like to make this point that it, it sounds a big number, but actually it's a small number. Uh, and <clears throat> the uh, scope for uh, more climate change litigation is uh, obvious. But let me um, say a little bit about the type of cases that are coming before the courts, because there's a, a, a wide range. Uh, some of them are uh, what you might call strategic, uh, picking up some of the points that um, Lord Adair made. Uh, some of them are Lord Adair Turner made. Some of them are uh, more specific to particular um, uh, projects. And let me give you. Uh, two examples. In France, we've seen the courts there uh, acting to uh, require the French government to uh, speed up its climate change uh, plans. Now, th that is a, a public law case. It's brought in the administrative courts in France. In fact, it was brought in the name of a, a commune in um, northern France, which is a, a coastal commune, which is threatened by um, rising sea levels. And uh, let me give, give you another uh, a very recent example, which is extremely important. A case of the German Constitutional Court, which is the highest court in Germany that construes the constitution of the country. Uh, in April, uh, it handed down a a decision to the effect that the German Climate uh, Change Act, which is much more recent than the one that we've enacted here, uh, violates fundamental freedom rights by offloading major emission reduction burdens into the future. In other words, uh, after 2030, 
And this is a, a theme you're beginning to see in a number of cases where uh, the courts are being asked to look at cases, not just from the perspective of, um, uh, of, of current um, claimants, but from the perspective of claimants to come. There have been a, a number of very effective suits, for example, brought in Australia, uh, where the claimants are children. And the, the point is an obvious one, uh, and is treated by the court as an obvious one too, I may say. Let me just uh, add this in relation to uh, this jurisdiction, um, in other words, uh, England and Wales, but I think it goes for the whole of the United Kingdom. As a common law country, we do not have the same uh, um, overarching procedures that have been deployed in uh, Germany um, and uh, in um, France, as I've mentioned. Uh, so th that explains partly the, the most recent decision on uh, the climate change related issue, which I know disappointed a lot of uh, a lot of people, the decision of the Supreme Court in the Heathrow Third Runway case. But it's important to understand that what the court was doing was uh, applying settled principle, albeit um, in the light of uh, how we know that the, the world is changing. And I completely agree with what uh, Howard said at the beginning and James about the pace of that. But that leads me to make what I believe is a very important point that we should not lose sight of. When you're uh, using the law um, and using courts, you must accept that you're doing so within the uh, bounds of the rule of law. Uh, and that, that uh, uh, leads to a second uh, very obvious point, which uh, again, everyone here will be very, very well aware of. And that is that this lever, this pressure point is only available in countries that observe the rule of law. Uh, uh, the, the, it's extremely interested to uh, hear um, shortly what the client earth representative in uh, China has to say that will be uh, absolutely fascinating. Last week, I was appointed as a, a one of a, a small group of international experts in Shanghai to look at the um, moves there to provide a better dispute resolution for Shanghai's an international financial center. Now, um, I don't yet know uh, whether um, uh, climate change will uh, 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 feature there, but it but it's certainly featuring more and more in financial and commercial uh, transactions uh, here. And, and by the way, the, I, I, I said um, that uh, uh, there's a difference between the strategic and the specific. A very, very good example of the specific is another client uh, case which stopped uh, um, the building of a coal power, powered uh, power station in Poland. And, and by the way, to go back to my point about the rule of law, and uh, I do uh, emphasize this, uh, this was not some kind of general uh, going to court and while asking the court to, to do something. Uh, in fact, that <coughs> client earth brought those, brought those proceedings as a shareholder in the uh, company concerned. I assume it had bought a few shares. Uh, and, uh, but the point is it was, it was able to use existing legal techniques to produce particular um, results. Now, uh, I said I was going to say something about uh, um, uh, uh, Australia and finance and um, perhaps a couple of cases to mention. Uh, first one that uh, uh, has been brought but may never go anywhere um, in a few days time though government's actually seeking to strike this one out. This is not one where it welcomes the pressure point. And that is a case where uh, um, a, a, a group of claimants are challenging the sovereign bond uh, disclosure um, provisions that Australia 
adopts. Australia has about 800 billion uh, Australian dollars outstanding. And what is said is that uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the government has, fail, has failed to adequately disclose uh, climate change risks. Now, um, for, for me as a financial lawyer of many, many years standing, it does seem a bit of an ask of a court. But if you stand right back from it and you look particularly at long-dated bonds, well, uh, it, but may it not be relevant to ask how a government is proposing to deal with climate change because payment is going to be in the future. Uh, and uh, let me take one other, um, uh, one other case from Australia. And this is uh, for, the, for, the, for the lawyers on the call, but I think it's a hugely important case. Uh, and that relates to another coal mine, uh, this time in, uh, I think it's Victoria, New South Wales, I forget which. And, and it's the same kind of issue that arose in the Polish case. The idea is that uh, the, the minister is being asked to uh, prove an expansion and the claimants are objecting uh, on the basis that uh, it's contrary to Australia's climate change obligations, so th these kind of arguments. But, and here's the really significant point. Howard, I know you're interested in new, uh, in new insights. And I, to, to me, and I say to me, this is uh, uh, what uh, um, uh, uh, observers are saying. The, the really crucial thing about the case was that the court um, recognized the existence of a general duty of care on the part of the minister in making these decisions. And that duty of care was um, defined by relation to uh, to, to climate change. This was the uh, case of the Australian children, by the way, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, now that case is coming on for um, on appeal in uh, Sydney in a, a couple of uh, next week, I think, in May. And then uh, the last uh, landmark case I want to um, mention uh, is a, a case that I, I think everyone on this call, probably particularly James. Uh, will be very, very focused on, and that's the Royal Dutch Shell case in the Netherlands. And uh, that was a decision of the, um, the administrative court in, in The Hague. Now, um, just to get straight to the point, because we're short of time, uh, what was, never mind for a moment, the legal route that they got there. It's not, not the same as the common law route, but there were similarities. Leave that on one side. <clears throat> The significance of the case was that it involved a business, not a company. And the, the business was being held to uh, climate change targets. And this is a, a quite a controversial point, by the way. Uh, it included not just Shell's business, not just the uh, business of Shell subsidiaries, but the businesses of its customers. So you can see immediately that uh, the uh, enormously wide um, significance of this. Uh, I, I, when I was looking this up on the internet, because of course I'm not a Dutch lawyer, uh, the best brief summary I found was in the Scientific American, I'm gonna read it out. Scientific Americans never wrong, as we know. For the first time in history, a court yesterday ordered a private company rather than the government to curb its planet warming pollution. <laughs> so that's uh, that's uh, that there will be an appeal. Uh, there are two levels of appeal in the Netherlands, but already in a case called uh, Uganda a couple of years ago, the Dutch Supreme Court. Uh, um, that was a, a public law case against the Netherlands government, but it made clear it's, if, 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 if I can put it in non-legal terms, it, it, it's up for it, but it remains to be seen whether the fact that this was a company uh, will make a difference. Now, uh, just uh, because there's a, 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 couple, of, a couple of minutes, uh, if I had less, one, one minute, one minute. Okay, I, can, yes. I can stop now, Howard. Um, I, I want to give Lord Howell a chance. I, I will stop now. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Bill, that was very, very good. So, um, Lord Howell, you hear of two forcing devices, the one described by Adair Turner, the Climate Change <laughs> Committee, another one described by uh, Bill Blair. Courts are becoming very active, um, but we're still not moving fast enough. What, what are your, um, pers what's your perspective on this? Well, uh, uh, we're still not moving fast enough, and your phrase, shuffling towards, no, Mr. Dallas's phrase, shuffling towards the abyss, are pretty gloomy. Um, I don't think we can be left in any doubt, particularly after Adair Turner's forceful comments, that here in the UK, on this little island, or two, or group of islands, um, we're doing rather well, thanks in, in large part to people like Adair himself and many other extremely eloquent setters of goals and ambitions who've uh, spoken out effectively, persuaded all the political parties with some uh, departure of margins, but basically all the political parties and successive governments to go for UK next year. And I suspect probably we will individually as a nation get there at a cost. I mean, as they rightly pointed out, tearing out gas boilers out of 27 million homes and uh, getting hydrogen into the gas grid system for some of them and getting uh, heat pumps into others. When you think of the millions and millions of flats in our cities and so on, it is formidable and vast cost. So it's going to be a cost, although there are all sorts of benefits, I don't dispute at all. That is terrific. But my question is a different one. And it more relates to Adair's other role as um, in, the, in the global in the global transition commission because switch from our contribution um which i think is adds about um or takes we close it all down about what slightly less than one percent of of annual global emissions slip to the global scene and what do you see you see the certain you see first of all emissions rising very fast now after the slowdown over the pandemic year if we kept up a slowdown, it would have been a different story, but we're not it's bounding up again to the basic trend it was on before 2019. Um, emissions are expected to rise very considerably right through the 20s. Um, the Paris requirements ask not merely for levelling, they ask for 7.6 reductions every year. So we're miles out. We're miles away and moving further away from the Paris targets for 2%, let alone 1.5%. And this is very, very serious. And the growth in emissions from the great driving emitters of the world, mostly the Asian utilities, and um, to some extent Africa and Latin America, um, and indeed uh, America, unless Biden is, gets his ambitions straight and, in, and through, which doesn't look all that likely, but even if he does, the, the growth areas of emissions are going to overwhelm by far all the splendid efforts we're making. And one, one has to come down to this rather gloomy reality and point out that you know, even if we're the most virtuous zero emission net zero people in the world, there's no little space above us because we've been virtuous in which there will be no carbon and no greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases don't understand about frontiers, they understand about moving everywhere and creating mayhem. Uh, and I'd even go check some of my friends and say, oh, don't, don't worry, it won't affect Britain so much. It may. We may be, have the same, hit by the same sort of thing as my German friends were last week or the week after. So it's got to be a world issue. And, it's, and that's why Adair's Global Transition Commission must be the, the spearhead. And the question is, what can we do uh, different from going all out for the net zero on the present plans, and the present recommendations of the Climate Change Committee? What can we do to make our maximum contribution as a bright and talented nation to this ine otherwise inevitable rise in global emissions with its inevitable consequences? And I just think that has got to be faced. I mean, we have the IEA, which 40 years ago I actually chaired for one session, uh, that have, we have them warning that um, 
emissions are rising now and due to rise very fast right through the 20s all round. We have um, the Chinese making commitments about 2060, and there is good news that uh, they're touched on, but the fact, the fact are that China has a thousand gigawatts of coal fired electricity. It's a thousand. Remember our national output is and capacity is about 65 gigawatts. They have a thousand gigawatts of coal alone, to which of course they are adding, although the, the language and rhetoric doesn't quite confirm that, but that was what they're doing. The BRI system, which is snaking across the world, is being propped up on all sorts of fossil fuel, including coal fired stations. Coal fired stations are being built in considerable numbers in Africa. The IOCs may be under pressure, like Shell we've just heard, and the pension funds may be pulling out of them, but at half the world's oil and gas comes from NOCs. And although they're in countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia and so on, um, and Russia, um, where there is some recognition of the advance of renewables, the fact is that they are not under the sort of investor pressure that the IOCs are. And that means that, that they're operating from a very different perspective. So I come back really to my central question. We are doing well. It's going to cost us. Uh, it's going, there are going to be tremendous, Europe's quite doing well as well. Again, they're going to have tremendous problems, obviously with the carbon tax, which uh, <laughs> the developing countries are taking great um, affront to, understandably. It does look like a sort of protection, but they're trying. And they may, carry, throughout Europe, they may successfully carry it forward. Although, again, in East and Central Europe, there are plenty of voices and indeed governments heading in different ways. But it may go quite well in, in UK, it will go well in UK, and it may go quite well in Europe. But the rest is unfortunately towering over us, and it's far bigger. And the question is, what can we do to contribute and change our present net zero strategy to a different one? I believe it should be different. I'm told it's all right. We'll be, we'll, the British will be a model, example, send signals and so on. I'm sorry, I, I travel the world, or I did before the pandemic quite a lot to many conferences. I haven't, haven't had much talk about models, examples and signals and tearing out 27 home heating gas boilers. I just don't hear that talk. I hear instead the fact that there are deemed to be 2.6 billion people with no access to electricity at all. I hear that the, the uh, Energy Hub for Growth estimates that half the world, 3.5 billion people, um, are facing what they call blow energy minimum uh, for, for modern conditions uh, per person. Uh, that, that, that's the task that the developing, the rising Asia, the rising Africa, the rising Latin America, that's the task that they're facing. How to get electricity to these people now? We tell them rightly that the costs of renewable are getting below the costs of coal, and they're mistaken. But their entire momentum is, their entire setting is to get the cheapest electricity to their electorates, to their voters, to their people as fast as possible. And they're not going to stop very long, unless the funds come along, of course, unless huge amounts of money come along from the developed, from the developed world. They're not going to stop very long before pushing ahead taking the cheapest and most immediate um, path, which is uh, not, I'm afraid, the path towards net zero at all. So that is the reality. If the reality is written in what you're going to see in the next five, 10 years, which are rising world emissions, adding, of course, to the, um, adding to, therefore, to the concentration in the atmosphere. And you're going to see people saying, uh, if we are to uh, cut back and delay Power to our people, then we want funds from the countries that caused all this in the first place. We heard about the 100 billion we were talking about five or 10 years ago. We haven't seen much of that, but probably it's more like a thousand billion, uh, in other words, a trillion, <clears throat> and maybe even more than that, to totally convert our entire energy systems to the new methods that you so cleverly have done in Europe. That's what the language we're going to hear. And we're going to hear people saying, where is the cheap technology? to cut carbon capture usage and emissions, CCUS, to get the cost down that we can put on the every chimney of every existing coal-fired stations because we cannot afford to close them all 
or rebuild them or tear them down. That's the, that's the debate that's coming ahead. It's going to be immensely challenging. I don't say it's not insuperable, but um, you know, it being being good here in Britain, being good in uh, Europe, being hoping to be good, as Mr. President Biden wants in America, all very virtuous and splendid, and and really admirable. But it does not do the job. It does not overcome the rising emissions, which are going to create more provinces, more our valley, uh, Rhine Valley disasters, and possibly many more disasters here at home, despite how good we've been. That's my contribution. Lord Howell, thank you very much for that. So we've had um, Lord Turner telling us it can be done, um, uh, Bill Blair telling us the courts are stepping up to the plate to, to, to help it along, but um, a very uh, a very cold dose of realism from Lord Howell. Um, there's a question mark hanging over this conversation, of course, which is what is happening in China. So, Dimitri, um, just very quickly, can you tell us, should we be optimistic or pessimistic about what is happening in China, and why should we be one of those? Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I actually wanted to share a, a few pictures uh, with you, but I, I see that I'm uh, not allowed to share my screen. Is that something that I can request, uh, Chair? No, I think you must talk us through it, Dimitri. Okay, very well. Uh, so you must have seen uh, the very dramatic pictures uh, coming out of Zhengzhou uh, since yesterday. Um, and the, the thing that shocked me the most was uh, uh, pictures, uh, video footage of people that were actually trapped in a subway um, where the water levels were rising and uh, they were trapped like uh, sardines in a can. Okay. Um, so I think it's it's very unfortunate, but you know it is these shocking uh, uh, footages, these disasters that are uh, waking us all up uh, to the reality um, that that climate change is coming closer to all of us, um, uh, not just in Germany or in Africa, uh, uh, but also in China. And um, as you all know, China is now approximately a third of the global emissions. Uh, where uh, a lot of OECD countries are reducing emissions, China is still gradually rising its emissions, and therefore uh, the share of, of China and, and Asia as a whole of global emissions are going to become uh, a larger piece of the pie. Currently, it's more than half of the world's emissions, and that's going to be more by 2030. So it matters uh, what happens here um, more than anything else. Um, a long time ago, in, in 2014, uh, James Thornton, the founder of Find Earth, uh, came to China and I uh, received him here uh, in a gathering with the Supreme People's Court, uh, the Ministry of Environment and uh, National People's Congress lawmakers, because we were discussing um, uh, environmental public interest litigation. And at the time, uh, there was a lot of uh, hope that uh, through public um, information disclosure and uh, uh, you know, opening up the courts to uh, civil society and also to public uh, interest prosecutors, it would be possible for, uh, you know, to, to establish a much more modern environmental governance system uh, in China and not rely so much on, um, you know, a top-down uh, structure. It was quite clear to everybody that there were limitations to what you can achieve um, with that. And so uh, since then, I uh, can confirm that we've had remarkable progress. It's, that was actually the moment that we decided to start Climate Earth in China. One of the uh, uh, judges of the Supreme People's Court approached James in private and said it would be remarkable if you could start doing your work in China. And so that's exactly what uh, we did. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, environmental courts and tribunals have been established at all levels uh, in the Chinese um, uh, hierarchy. Uh, and prosecutors, specialized environmental public interest prosecutors uh, have been uh, formed around the country. And just in 2020, those prosecutors brought over 80,000 cases for the environment. Some are smaller than others, some are bigger. Um, one of the largest ones, uh, which is the, not yet quite public, um, is about to uh, become public, uh, has a, a total um, value of uh, 30 billion RMB. So that's more than, uh, that's about more than 3 billion uh, UK pounds. 
in a single case uh, that related to a mafia gang being rolled up. Um, they did all kinds of horrible things, but interestingly, the biggest uh, punch that they got eventually was for the fact that they had been doing illegal sand excavation around the country. And there was so much evidence of that. Uh, and they were asked to remediate all of the damage that they caused the environment. So um, these things matter. It also matters because most of these cases are actually being brought against local governments. And in China, the problem is that a lot of local governments, and in fact, the whole population isn't very well aware of the environment or climate change as a whole. So uh, for all of um, some people in the West wanting to see more democracy in China, uh, that would be a disaster for the climate, I'm afraid, because these people really don't know anything about climate change and would not vote for any um, uh, strong climate change efforts at this moment. Mm. Um, China uh, enacted the, um, uh, the pledge uh, to go carbon neutral by 2060 last September. That was a very important moment. Since then, we've seen a lot more uh, public discussion and also you know, among government, among uh, researchers. And in fact, all of society is much more interested in understanding more about reducing carbon emissions. Um, just this year, the Supreme People's Court hosted the World Conference on Environmental Adjudication. Uh, again, an interesting moment. It wasn't covered so much in the media, but uh, a declaration was formed, which uh, speaks very ambitiously about the role of the courts uh, in the environment, in climate uh, action, etc. cetera. Um, and also on the Belt and Road Initiative, we see a lot of progress. I personally wrote a recommendation, uh, which I understand has been uh, receiving very positive uh, uh, comments from the president of China, uh, that uh, coal should be uh, banned in uh, China's overseas investments. I'm quite hopeful that we may see news about that before the Glasgow COP. Um, there's also um, what we see in practice is that already no new coal projects are being approved in the Belt and Road. In 2020, not a single new coal fire power plant was approved. Most of the coal fire power plants from previous uh, uh, approvals have been shelved. Um, and also this year, we're seeing more and more news reports of Chinese uh, financial institutions actually pulling out of large coal fire power plants in the Belt and Road. Just the last Friday, a uh, government policy was uh, introduced that sets uh, green standards uh, and green, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, sort of, sort of a great, uh, an environmental bottom line on Chinese overseas investments, and that's something that uh, we have very, uh, you know, actively lobbied for. So that's uh, one of our achievements. Um, we jointly with the Ministry of Environment developed that uh, policy. Now, in terms of challenges, uh, we have yeah um, a lot of challenges. You know, in uh, I, I am actually like right now more worried about new coal in China. Uh, last year, 50 through giga gigawatts of new coal was approved in China alone. Uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases are about 15% above pre-COVID levels. Uh, so the allowance, let's say, that China has set itself for uh, growing emissions in the 45 plants so between now and 2025 is already used up. Um, yeah, and Dimitri, so, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because we are right on our time. Um, so. You've said an awful lot in a very short time, and thank you so much for doing that. The sense that we get from all of these things is that the world is changing. It is just changing too slowly. And the thing that the Scotia Group, one of the things it wants to do is, is use what influence it can to make the world change faster. Let me leave you with that thought. Let me thank all of our excellent speakers for being here. Uh, it was uh, a remarkable, it was remarkable of you to present the material that you did. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry we haven't had time for questions, but I thought the stuff with the material was so interesting, we should hear it. So with that thought, let me conclude this webinar and we'll proceed to the next step, the Majlis in, in just a minute. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Hart, and thank you, all the other speakers.